Good morning, everybody. Um, the, the case that we we're going to discuss today is the, the Mersey Gateway project. Um, um, and um, it's quite a good project in the sense of um, um, it's been running for about 20 years now, just uh, just under 20 years, and um, it's gone through quite an extensive design process and, um, and is now operational. Um, so just by way of introductions, uh, my name is Jeff Turner. I'm uh, um, an associate director uh, with Ramble um, in the Chester office. Um, I've got over 20 years experience on impact assessment and environmental management um, on a, a wide range of projects, both in terrestrial and marine environments um, across um, infrastructure, uh, power, highways, uh, rail and bridges and renewable energy. And um, I've been working um, on the Mersey Gateway on and off since uh, 2001 um, and recently was a member of the client's technical advisor team. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, my colleague Nigel Cousins. Hi, I'm Nigel Cousins. I've also been on the Mersey Gateway since 2001, which seems like a bit of a life sentence. Uh, my background is in contaminated land and led off on the contaminated land work for the Mersey Gateway. Um, witness that part of this area the site crosses is very heavily contaminated. Uh, and then I was also involved in the environmental impact assessment processes further down the line uh, and then carrying with that um, into construction. I think the way uh, Jeff and I are going to do this talk is Jeff's largely going to lead it and then I'll, I'll interject at times where, where appropriate, where I can add to it, but rather than sort of switch back and forth between slides. Thanks, Nigel. Um, so this is just give you a bit of context um, of, of the the project itself. So this is um, the scheme under construction. Um, so it's located in a, um, a sort of an upper estuarine environment, um, and um, um, as you can see, it's it's sandwiched between um, uh, two towns, which will we'll give you a bit of context on that in a minute. And um, just for reference, um, the kind of what was the existing communication routes across that part of the world um, in the Northwest is um, the Silver Jubilee Bridge, which is that um, nice arch bridge you can see in, in the background. So, so, so what is the Mersey Gateway? So it's um, a, a one kilometer long six lane cable stayed bridge over the River Mersey uh, between Runcorn and Widnes in the Northwest of England. I think it's um, one of the largest, if not the largest, infrastructure project um, in the north of England over recent years. Um, part of the project included uh, an additional nine kilometres of roads and sustainable transport improvements across the network in the area. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale, the total project value was in the order of £2 billion and the construction value was £600 million, um, And it's currently catering for approximately £27 million um, journeys across the bridge per year. Um, so um, the, I feel like one of the key objectives was to improve journey times um, across the road network um, in, in that region, um, particularly with um, the bottlenecks that were experienced with the, um, the Civil, Ju Civil Jubilee Bridge, um, as I just pointed out. So that was a key bottleneck, particularly with um, vehicles breaking down or, or accidents on the wider uh, motorway network. Um, the bridge was seen as a um, as something more than just a bridge, um, and um, it was seen as a, a catalyst for uh, regeneration in the area for what is quite a um, um, a deprived part of the world, um, and um, um, with the the objective of trying to um, increase employment and jobs. Um, and the area is very uh, environmentally sensitive, um, so as you could see it's um, in a estuarine environment. Um, there's a number of uh, international, national and local uh, environmental designations in the area. And as Nigel said, um, the, the area's got um, a, a strong legacy um, of, in, of its industrial past. Uh, Witness was uh, once the, uh, coined the, the chemical capital of the world. And perhaps just worth adding, Jeff, there, that our client for it was, uh, we've got the next one was Halton Borough Council. Um, and, and that kind of sets the context a bit in that one of the challenges of the scheme, because they're the smallest unit authority in the country, was actually fitting the project within their boundaries. So just a, a brief uh, kind of overview of the, the project timeline. As as Nod said, uh, Ramble was appointed by Holtenborough Council, very small uh, unit, unitary authority um, in 2001, uh, initially to look at um, feasibility for a new bridge crossing. 
um, and then it's gone through um, option of funding appraisal, uh, a major scheme appraisal in 2006, then development of the environmental impact assessment process and submission of the orders and applications, um, which was through the Transport and Works Act. Um, but there was also two additional Town and Country Planning Act applications, uh, public inquiry in 2009, um, with further planning consultation and updates uh, through to 2011. And, and then since then, it's gone through um, um, a procurement and review of um, the construction contractors um, proposals with construction starting in 2014. And uh, it was through the design, build, finance and operate scheme, DBFO. And the scheme was uh, completed and opened in 2017. Um, and um, we have an active involvement still um, as a client's advisor for, uh, for post-construction works. So, so what we've done is um, just highlighted four um, if you like key sort of design points, if you like, um, and um, the of you know of many, um, and um, we'll touch upon them. So whilst they uh, might not be applicable to every single project you're working on, um, the the actual kind of theory behind it is very comparable. Um, so so to start with, um, uh, we went through a sort of a route and options appraisal process, um, um, which is primarily to um, to look at options and alternatives um, so um, this was undertaken very early in the process and um, the the sketch you can see there kind of outlines the uh, the different options we considered and trying to meet um, um, the client's objectives um, and uh, this looked at different locations and different route options um, different types of bridges were considered um, at that point um, and uh, uh, an early analysis of the environmental constraints and input into the options appraisal was undertaken at that point. Um, we also under, undertook a, um, an identification of who the key stakeholders were um, uh, because we acknowledged that uh, early engagement with those stakeholders was, was critical to the success of the project. Um, and at that point, we also worked very closely with the client to understand their needs, uh, the scheme brief, and also um, how we can, um, um, I suppose, influence that um, from an environmental perspective. Um, so as part of that process, um, we work very closely with our engineering colleagues and, and um, we um, had a very collaborative relationship with them. So um, I think as Adam alluded to earlier, this uh, we were trying to avoid the um, them, if like working up a design and us assessing the impacts and, and then having to go back and forth. And so we, we uh, worked far more collaboratively with them and um, um, as part of a, a, an iterative design process. Um, so as part of this, um, as you can see by the sketches, these were the, the kind of early concept sketches for the different bridge types that they could have put across the river. And um, um, it was everything from a single span to, if you like, short spans across the river. So we had to review all them. Um, and the objective there was to uh, relieve congestion on the, the local road network. Um, uh, funding was identified as a key issue um, and how to make the economics work. Um, at the early stages, there was uh, very little funding from the Department for Transport. Um, um, the environmental sensitivities we had to consider, as, as we just mentioned, and and also the socioeconomic factors. You know, particularly given the um, um, the, the, the the deprivation um, in the um, in the local area. Um, and as part of that process, we, we identified several key stakeholders. So these included um, the, the the local airport uh, in Liverpool, uh, Natural England, uh, Peel Holdings were a, a, a key landowner um, and also had um, management of the of the estuary, um, the environment agency and also um, a, uh, a very bizarre role um, called the Acting Mersey Conservator, um, who will we'll come on to shortly. So another key aspect um, in the river was was the hydrodynamics and and how um, uh, the the project would interface with its environment by putting structures in the river. Um, so um, potential effects um, were 
uh, raise about scour and channel fixing around uh, the bridge towers in the river. Um, so the river is tidal at this point, um, um, although um, it's predominantly um, dry for, for most of the tidal cycle, but has quick floods. Um, and uh, so long periods of exposed sands and um, but permanent but very mobile channels, um, as you can probably see in the, the aerial photograph there. Um, and as I mentioned, the, um, the, the River Mersey has a, um, a uh, so, um, as a, a role as a conservator, um, which is a, uh, a unique role which was laid out by, by the Crown, um, but now um, managed by the Department for Transport. But that, uh, that role is for the responsibility of maintaining the navigation and uh, the environment in the river. I think one of the key things with, with that was the conservator was very keen to ensure that that mobile environment remained protected. The fact that the channel switched back and forth all the time was a really key concern in that, which was a challenge because it meant we were working off a variable baseline. It wasn't possible to establish exactly where all these channels moved and exactly what the factors were that caused them to, to flick back and forth. So part of that design process was to um, to undertake quite an extensive um, hydrodynamic modelling and morphological baseline assessment process, um, and and that involved uh, working very closely with um, our um, engineering colleagues on different um, uh, shapes of towers, different locations, um, and and also uh, working very closely with these key stakeholders, um, both external and internal. Um, most notably, the the acting conservator to to try and achieve a. Um, a positive um, environmental outcome, um, um, and um, and it's quite an interesting process. Um, involved quite extensive use of aerial photography to to map these channels over time, um, and um, so we had somebody um, flying um, over over the area um, monthly just to 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 monitor these um, these channels and to to monitor the morphological effects. Um, and also there was um, um, a lot of wave tank modeling undertaken, uh, looking at the um, the different bridge options um, to to try and to um, 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 achieve a, a strong environmental outcome, uh, minimize the effects on the river. Um, so the design was developed to reflect the the outcomes and um, and confirm the selected bridge option. Um, and um, and as part of that, um, it was a, a, a really good example where, um, as part of this kind of collaborative approach, um, um, uh, we managed to to achieve a, a solution which was acceptable to all parties and um, and maintained and and strengthened the um, I suppose the um, the uh, environmental outcomes in in that part of the estuary. So the third aspect of the design um, I wanted to touch upon was um, was something called the trestle. Um, um, so this is, um, um, if you like, a, a, a temporary working platform that was constructed across the river, um, um, which you can um, just see part of the construction of in, in the photograph there. Um, so it's essentially a, a kind of piled um platform and um and and its purpose was to support the construction of the bridge towers and um and for safe working access and and this was something which as part of the design process was um reviewed um, um, um to, to try and maintain um get a, a a good working um um and safe working platform for um for the construction of the bridge um and um and originally, as part of the design, it was meant to be only halfway across the river. And, and this was on the assumption of the potential impacts it could have on navigation, scour, um, and also the ecology, um, and in particular fisheries. Um, and um, uh, we undertook quite a few um, um, assessments um, to look at this with the engineers and um, and. Um, it indicated that we could um, um, put the trestle across the entire width of the river. Um, and um, um, we used the process called NEWT, which um, is uh, a not environmentally worse than um, approach um, to, to hand over and monitor the design process. 
Perhaps worth um, just interjecting there to, to give a little bit of more background to that design process because we were appointed by the client as their advisor. So we prepared a reference design, which was then used as the basis for the environmental statement. Um, and, we, and we did a lot of work around that on this high dynamics piece and that ended up with the overall form of the bridge, which, which define, and, and from the reference design, the ES design defined certain parameters that wouldn't move. So you'll see in the pictures to the three main towers and that was one of the key ones that came through. We then went through a procurement process for a design and build contractor and they had a designer on board who then refined that design, took it forward. So they made some changes to the design. For example, it changed from a steel, a steel, steel and concrete composite deck to overall concrete, and that suited them better. And that's where this new process came in, in that they were able to alter the design to suit their way of working, but they had to go through a loop to demonstrate that it wasn't any worse than what we'd already accept, um, assessed. And that was where extending the trestle across the whole river came from. So they went into another loop of negotiation with the stakeholders around, around um, altering the design within certain parameters. So, um, as Nod said, so um, um, one of the benefits um, that transpired through through that process was um, by extending the the trestle across the entire width of the river, we were able to um, allow a construction plant to be uh, to use it to get from one bank to the other, um, so thereby reducing the volume of construction traffic movements. Um, on the local road network and having to go through the local towns so they could just um, use that structure to go back and forth across the river um, and um, and again this was another um, sort of key sort of design process which um, had to go through quite um, yeah, extensive consultation both within the team um, and, but also with um, the external stakeholders um, including the local boating clubs, so we had to maintain uh, a right of navigation. So um, a, a, a lift bridge was put in place uh, to keep uh, navigation. So the final aspect then was uh, sort of the design and construction phase, and um, so so we had a role as um, um, as part of the design and, and construction, and um, um, and I think this is looking more at that kind of monitoring aspect as well. Um, so, um, so regular design uh, reviews are undertaken, uh, which are tied to the EIA process, and and a key consideration of all this is the buildability um, aspect. So, so what we wanted to make sure is that. Um, um, whatever uh, mitigation and uh, environmental uh, measures we were putting in place were um, were actually buildable. Um, so um, and and that had sort of sustainability aspects. So we didn't want to be, um, I suppose, um, um, creating a situation where um, there'd be excess concrete or uh, materials used um, in that design process. So there were checks and balances put in place to make sure that the the project was buildable um, um, and the, the mitigation we were putting forward was um, uh, could tie into that. Um, so construction management plans uh, were prepared by the contractor um, and, and there's also um, um, quite a lot of monitoring um, um, embedded through the process. Um, so for example on the hydrodynamic side of things um, there's monitoring being taking place to to, to monitor the scour um, and and channel fixing, um, and and that was a key part of uh, of the design and EIA process to identify that, um, and also uh, as part of the uh, the legacy of the scheme, um, an environmental trust has been set up, um, and and that uh, is being used to to monitor the effects and um, and also implement some of the longer term mitigation. So I suppose to summarise, um, you know, how does EI inform a quality design? Um, so um, the opportunity for EI to bridge gaps between engineering, feasibility and design, um, um, early engagement with the project design team is critical um, for successful outcomes, so a collaborative approach. Um, and, and and this allows successful integration of um, sort of environmental, social and, and stakeholder acceptability and, and and um, and as part of that is is the early identification of what the environmental issues are. So at the different stages, pre-app stages, screening, scoping, but um, also going forward through construction and monitoring phases as well. Um, the the consultation with stakeholders is 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 another very important aspect, and um, and that's what molds the 
um, um, I suppose the acceptability and and trying to achieve a, a strong environmental outcome but um, at the same time having a scheme which works and is buildable um, but again not at the expense of the environment. Um, a more robust application um, um, it drives a more robust application uh, process and um, and I think um, results in a more resilient design um, and um, a more sustainable solution so um, there's far more opportunities to to incorporate um, those measures and, and 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 now more recently with um, I think the carbon agenda is, is driving that even um, even more strongly um, um, and as I said before you know an iterative design process is key um and it's um and, and it's trying to drive in um, um environmental solutions and 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 i suppose get more balance um uh, between um i suppose all the as aspects of these projects um so the, i think the last two points there the key is um from our role um is always the challenge challenge the design challenge the engineers challenge everything um and um and ultimately um from a client's perspective hopefully there'll be no surprises um and i think the um the uh, the figure in the slide you probably won't be able to see it in detail but um i think that shows um if you like how that process should work um uh, whether that works for all projects is probably debatable but um that's what we should be trying to strive for so um nigel i don't know if you want to sort of wrap up the summary um can do i mean i think what we did was we did have it we did manage to generate a, a close collaboration across the whole design team and i think that was in part credit to the engineers as much as to us in that they were willing to listen and i think Quite early on, they, they understood that there were some really key environmental factors on this scheme that would drive the whole thing. Um, and I sort of cast my mind back to the picture Jeff put up of all the different options. And the, the, the bridge that's built is not the cheapest option. Um, the, the viaduct effect with the lots of little piers across the river would probably have been cheaper overall. Um, the suspension bridge option would have not put any um, obstructions at all in the river and in theory could have spanned across the salt marshes as well um, and would have had in that in that sense kind of no environmental impacts in such a sensitive environment but was also by far the most costly but I think in in, in that process we came up with a solution of the three towers that that minimized the effects in the sensitive estuary environment and still provided a cost cost effective solution and you touched on the environmental trust which I think kind of goes to Adam's points about perhaps offering a bit more than just the minimum in that that was a vehicle intended to try and embed into it those long-term environmental improvements on the salt marshes um, one of the key challenges was the effects on the salt marshes when we take away the temporary road and reinstating those um, and, and that's something that probably is going to take years to sort out it's not the kind of thing you can take away a road across a salt marsh and expect it to be remediated within a within a few months by the contractor before he leaves um, and then we've got the point in there about the iterative process I think we got quite good at that and we got to a point where um, we earned the respect of the engineers to a degree in that we tried to be reasonable with them. We didn't try to say environment, environment means this has to stop, you cannot do this because there's always so many other factors to take into account. And that goes, I guess, to the point there about knowing which battles to fight. Um, there were times when um, you gave way a bit on environment and, and you have to do that and, and let there be a bit of push and pull. Um, and I just pose a bit of a question at the end there about who should coordinate and manage these projects, which, which is a debate we have at times is, is should it be run by the environment team and the engineers are subordinate to, um, to that st strand? Or is it appropriate for the engineers to lead it all the time and we respond to them? Or should there be a balance in between that maybe for some of these earlier stages, um, environmental professions, professionals take more of a role in managing these major projects? Uh, and then there's a point further down the track where it hands over to other parties um, who are more appropriate to lead it at that time. So I think that's us, Jeff, isn't it? That's us.